you know, when I first heard about your book and that you were coming and that I would get to interview you, I immediately thought about um, an image of a shepherd came into my mind of a man with a long beard and a long flowing robe and a giant crook, <laughs> staff crook. Um, you know, because, I mean, there really is a kind of cultural figure of the shepherd still kind of circulating in many of our minds. But you do use a crook. I was at least yeah. right on one count. We do use a crook. Yeah. I, did, I did have a mother and son come to, who met me one day, and the mother explained what I did. And the son said, what, like in the Bible? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Same thing. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, people don't believe me, but the, the crook that you have is the, the most important tool that you have as a shepherd. So... Um, particularly when at lambing time when I need to catch the sheep, you can the sheep know exactly how close they can come to you before they need to be worried about you catching them, and it's about two or three yards away. Yeah. But if you have the crook, you you, you cheat. You can with one step you can you can catch them. So it's sort of the your version of the lasso. Uh, yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm conscious whenever I talk to Americans that sheep are sort of feminine, aren't they? Whereas cattle are butch and macho. So. I'm on a mission to change that. Hopefully, I will. There are, yeah. there are sheeps of all persuasion. Is that what we should understand? <laughs> we could take this to many places. Right, we could take it many. Well, we won't, we won't. But, um, so, no, the crook was interesting because you have a beautiful passage. I mean, this is a book full of beautiful um, writing uh, scenes um, and also, you know, very clear about the hard work um, that your life involves. But, you know, the crooks themselves, you, some of them are made out of the horns of some of the sheep, and so they have this you know, they're cultural, they're, they're tools that you use to work, but they're also cultural um, objects. And that's what I love about this book because you're writing about a whole way of life, a culture, and culture is a very important part of the way you're trying to communicate about what it is that you do. Yeah, I'm, uh, I hope I don't sound at all pompous, I, I really don't mean to. What I was trying to do with the book was to rescue what I do from a very modern idea that farming should be entirely industrialized and that everything we do is about commodity production and profit. Mm -hmm. And that just isn't the world that I grew up in and that isn't the culture that I grew up in. So uh, I wanted to muster any talent that I have as a writer to try and explain it as a culture or a way of life or however people want to describe it. And I, 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 I'm getting into politics straight away, but I think that's really, really important. If we want to avoid uh, a very negative future for the land in which it all belongs to a handful of very large corporations mm -hmm. and uh, we want to entirely lose our relationship with the animals and the soil and the other things then then now's the moment to start fighting for that and i, I wanted to try and do that in a little way through a story about my crazy family really <laughs> well um i think many of us even if we've read the book and i know some of us in the audience elaine and roger for sure have been to the part of the world where you live and work but um, many of us have not. And even if we've been there, we may not know what your world looks like. So can you, I mean, these photos are helping, but can you take us there? Give us the lay of the land and a sense of the daily yeah. pace of life. Okay. Uh, well, maybe, maybe the best place to start is about two hours drive down the road. So um, the world that I think Sh Chicago came from is probably the industrial world, isn't it? The sort of world of change, the world of new things. Yep. And the birthplace of of the Industrial Revolution is about two hours south of where I live. It's in Lancashire and Greater Manchester. And uh, about two hours north of that, the other side of an estuary, the other side of mountains, the other, we call them fells because they're quite small by American standards, um, are fells, uh, mountains. Uh, there was this isolated, very poor, poor place, which is about 800 square miles, so it's not very big. And there was a place where the past had sort of survived. Not perfectly, it was relating to the rest of the world, but very old ways of life, very old ways of farming had survived. And as the Industrial Revolution kicked off um, and came up the road, if you like, it, uh, our landscape was probably the first place in the world where people formulated the arguments about why you would protect beautiful places or historic places and why that might be in the public interest. So the first mention anywhere in literature, as I understand it, of a public, sorry, of a national park is in something Wordsworth wrote. He said this place is so beautiful, uh, it should belong to anybody with an eye to see or a heart to feel, and uh, should be a kind of national park. And that's, that's probably the first time anybody ever comes up with that idea. Um, as with everything else in England, we're way too late at actually making that happen. So America beat us, beat us to actually having national parks. Um, but that's, so that's the place it is. And, and what is it? It's effectively 13 valleys. Um, 
uh, surrounded by sort of glacial valleys and uh, mm -hmm. sort of glacial fells and mountains. And uh, the landscape is entirely, the surface of the skin of the land is entirely man-made over the last five to 10,000 years. So you have about 5,000 years of hunter-gatherers. And then quite quickly, about 5,000 years ago, you have settled small farms and people doing what, what I still do, which is taking the sheep to the mountains. And whereas the rest of England modernized and was enclosed and became private land enclosed by fences, uh, our landscape was so poor that by the time they got around to trying to fence it and trying to make it sort of productive and modern, um, the conservation movement was up and running and protected it. So the mountains where my sheep go in summer are still common land, and I share them with 10 other farmers and flocks. So it's, a sort of, it's like a sort of little glacier of the past that somehow elements of it have survived despite all these things happening around it. Why do you think that is? I mean, there's the isolation, there's the poverty, so you kind of have a communal um, effort maybe, but why, why has so little changed about the way you do your work? I mean, in yeah. the face of this, yeah. as you're saying, like kind of corporatization, industrialization yeah. of farming the, and the like. I think one of the reasons is uh, tourists coming to the lake. So in the book, uh, uh, forgive me, if you like going to beautiful places on holiday, forgive me. The beginning of the book is me being a teenager and being very grumpy about people visiting other, other people's landscapes. Um, I think I've grown up since then, it's okay. Uh, but the truth is, from about 250 years ago, the farmers in our landscape diversified. They realized that the people coming into their landscape to view it because it was beautiful would give them money if they turned tricks, basically. <laughs> Uh, there's, a wonderful story, there's a wonderful story about some people traveling from the south of England to our landscape and asking one of the farmer's sons to be a guide to take them up the mountain. Yeah. Uh, and his response was, up there, what the hell for? <laughs> because the idea of going up a mountain for leisure was so entirely alien to people that worked in that landscape. Yeah. It was baffling. But uh, the footnote to, the, footnote to the, the joke, if you like, is that he did take them up there and he got the money. And what's, what that's meant is that... Uh, people have been able to sort of keep one foot in the past and one foot in the present. They've been able to pay their bills just about uh, and survive and, and also to earn the money to keep going. So nearly all of my friends are not just farmers. They're very traditional farmers with one hand and with the other. They own a guest house or a and b or they do other work off the farm in summer. And the other reason why it's survived is uh, there actually isn't another way to farm that landscape. Mm -hmm. There's no modern, in, modern version of it. So the reason that in most of the... Uh, lowland agricultural land around the rest of the world has changed so rapidly is that you could use bigger machinery, you could use faster machinery, um, you could sweep away what was there in the past and do something new and more efficient. Mm -hmm. In our landscape, you can't really do that. Um, you can only really farm it with sheep. And despite lots of attempts to farm more modern sheep in that landscape, people keep coming back to the fact that the traditional breeds actually are the right thing for that landscape anyway. So there's a story from the valley close to mine, about a shepherd who in the 1950s had modernized. He got rid of the Herdwick sheep that I breed, and he'd got a slightly more modern breed. And for about 15 years, he'd done really well. He was making more money than his neighbors. And of course, the old shepherds say, it'll come unstuck. Just you wait and see. And all the young shepherds are looking at this guy thinking, that's what we should be doing. We should be modernizing. should have these more modern sheep, which are more productive. Uh, and then in 1963, Britain had its worst ever winter. And the, the valley was snowed in for nearly 16 weeks and uh, many of the sheep were buried, and nearly every single one of the more modern productive sheep died in the mm. snowdrifts. And the remnant of the historic flock, which were the native heritage breed, all survived. And in the memories of all of the older people in my valley, that's the lesson. The lesson is if you stick to the ways that work in the long run, they're the sustainable ways, that you sacrifice some efficiency and productivity, but that's the genuinely most sustainable ways to have the breed of that area and to farm it in the way that our forefathers and foremothers, foregrandmothers did. Yeah, yeah. So that's why you're, because your family kind of doubled down. They went, not only yeah. kept shepherding, but you um, more recently moved to the more traditional way of yeah. shepherding. We've acti actively stepped back about 100 years in the yeah. way that we farm that landscape. Um, and it was pure and simply because the cost of labor and the cost of oil meant that the modern ways were no longer sustainable. So. Uh, we were having to use more and more, more uh, artificial feedstuffs, more and more artificial fertilizers, more and more chemicals to farm in the way that my grandfather thought was progressive. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're looking across the fence at our neighbors who'd never modernized, thinking, hang on a minute, they know what they're doing. Um, and 
whilst I have huge respect for the business skills of many modern intensive farmers, um, the unfortunate truth about what many of them do is that it's reliant upon oil and antibiotics. So I happen to believe very sincerely that uh, I, don't want to, I don't want to do them down. They're doing what the market tells them they should do and they're trying to survive in their own way. But I happen to believe in the very long run we'll have to go back to the heritage breeds, we'll have to go back to ways of producing crops that are from manure and not from artificial fertilizer that's created from oil. So I think it's a very good idea if we preserve those systems. Not everywhere. I don't think we should live in the past. Um, but I think it's a very good idea to preserve those breeds, preserve those traditions, preserve those historic farming systems, because it's probably in the long run in all of our interest to do so. Yeah. I was thinking that when I read the book that I think it's the, is it the dipping that you talk about? Like there are elements of um, shepherding or working with sheep that are kind of toxic, right? And are those things that have changed over your lifetime? Yeah. Um, well, the, away from well, some of those? Well, the truth is this, the, the thing I wrote about, about the, the chemical dip going into the river when we were kids. So there's a bit in my book where I write about being a kid sitting on the bridge over the stream, the river. And we used to think it was very entertaining on the day that my f grandfather dipped his sheep in, in the chemical dip that stops the flies attacking them because it used to trickle. You could see it trickle down the lane and then go into the beck. And then we would see eels and like trout uh, popping to the top and then like... And it was like an entertaining thing to see yeah. um, as a kid, yeah? Um, of course, you grow up and you think, no, that's not right, that's not right at all. Um, so the truth is there's been massive progress on things like that. Partly people, people have become more educated, don't they? They realize that something that they didn't think was a major environmental problem is actually dead wrong and we shouldn't do that. Um, and the legislation's tightened up, so uh, the chemicals you can use, how you use them, whether they spill out into the neighboring watercourses, all of that's highly illegal now, thankfully, and doesn't happen. But when I was writing the book, I did want to write about the fact that um, being a farmer is actually difficult, morally difficult and eth ethically difficult, and I'm just writing about that in the next book that I'm trying to write. Um, I think if you're disconnected from the land... Uh, I think it's tempting to think that you can opt out of the things that happen on land. And I don't think you can. I think whether, you, whether you're the farmer or you eat the things the farmer grows, the truth is a field is a cleared area of woodland or some other native habitat. Uh, its clearance moves the animals that are there before. Mm -hmm. It's maintained by artificial measures, basically. You're keeping out other animals, which you call press, or other um, wild plants that you don't want in there. Uh, even to grow lettuces and things that people would think were sort of more ethically pure, um, a, a lot of things die, so that, happened, so that happens. And I don't think there is a way of opting out of that. There's ways of minimizing your impact on the earth, but uh, none of us can entirely opt out of it. So I wanted to write a book that was truthful about that, that yeah, said, look, yeah. if you're a farmer, you do some stuff that you might not like, um, but you're trying to do the right thing. Um, and it's, uh, and it's difficult. To give you an example of this, the, the hay meadows in the valley bottom where I grow the winter crop for my sheep uh, should be amazing uh, wild, wild flower meadows. And they're a really valued habitat. So five years ago, I decided, um, I got an expert in, an ecologist. I said, how do I get this back to how it would have been 100 years ago with all of the wild flowers? He said, well, there's less than there should be because there's too much nitrogen on it. You farmed it too well. Yeah. So if I want there to be more wild flowers, I have to remove the nitrogen from it, so I stop sowing artificial fertilizer on it. I think I'm doing the right thing. Um, but if I'm honest, I'm looking at them five years later, there's a little few more flowers, but not many. <laughs> not many. And I know exactly how much it's costing me. It's costing me about two and a half thousand pounds a year because of my loss in yield. So the, the, the reason my father and grandfather thought it was a good idea to put the fertilizer on was that we grew um, something like 40% more grass. And the value of that to me is two and a half thousand pounds. So the truth is, I don't exactly know where the, where the right course of action is in that. I'm now looking yeah. at it thinking, are, are the few more flowers really that important? Are they really worth two and a half thousand pounds? And, and I think that's the reality of farming. Whether you're the farmer or the person that eats the things I grow, that's the, that's the truth. It's difficult. This is, a, this is a thing that I wanted you to talk about because, um, you know, so our theme overall for the festival is speed um, and there are ways in which, of course, we wanted to talk about things not just accelerating but things slowing down, yeah. things that are rapidly changing and things that have stayed yeah. the same and in yeah. part you represent that. But it's also, it's not just that you do something that people have done for centuries, for thousands of years um, and there's a continuity to that. It's... It's that you have to think in very long, you're not thinking in century time, but you're thinking like when you're 
deciding on a, to buy it, purchase a sheep. You have a great uh, scene with um, one of the women, Jean. You get to do a deal for uh, a group of female use yep. and you say, you know, I'm paying for something a long time in the making. Yeah. So you have to be able to sort of think like that. And how easy is that? And how do, how do you do that, well, you know? Well, I... It, it, it's difficult, but I think the difficulty is good. I think that's exactly... It relates back to the previous thing we just discussed. Um, I think... I think probably farmers all around the world, but certainly the farmers I grew up among were encouraged not to think about the long term. To that that was somehow backwards, that you should think of it purely as profit and loss, purely mm -hmm. as about efficiency and productivity, and about the bottom line on your accounts at the end of the year. So a sort of 12-month cycle was as far as you were encouraged to think. Mm -hmm. And I've come to the conclusion that that doesn't work on the land. Um, and there's masses of evidence to show that, that it actually results in the sort of depletion of the soil and the, and the bird life and the wildlife and the flowers and the butterflies and other things. So it's... Uh, it's very difficult in a world that wants to pay you the cheapest possible price for the things that you produce. So if I do all of the right environmental things on my land and my neighbor doesn't, my neighbor will produce things more cheaply than I will, and in the long run, we'll, we'll, we'll if not put, if, if they don't, even if they don't put me out of business, they'll be in a better position to expand and buy land next to me or to outcompete with me on other, in other ways. So. Um, it's really difficult. I think what I'm, what I'm trying to say, and I can't quite get the conversation around to is, one of my heroes is Wendell Berry. Um, um, actually, I have two, um, two great American heroes, Wendell Berry and Jane Jacobs, and huh. they're both brilliant for the same reason in my view, one urban and one rural, is that they're, in my view, profits about how we can't have fast all the time. We can't have efficiency as the only measure, or cheap as the only measure. That that's a fundamentally flawed way of looking at things, that you can't only have the new, you have to take the old with you. Um, I heard a thing that Jane Jacobs said the other day where she said, there is no new without the old. And that's exactly how I feel about farming. Uh, yes, the world is full of people that need, that are working on minimum wage and maybe can't afford organic chicken, they can't afford to pay three times more like some of us can. Um, but I think, I think we've, we've got into a sort of false economy of, regarding food and farming. Since you invoked Wendell Berry, I wanted to ask you, because you know we had Helen McDonald um, of HS for Hawk here earlier this year, um, and you and Helen and um, Robert McFarlane, you know, there's sort of grouped, I think there are others, of, of kind of a new wave of writing about nature. And do you identify, I mean, I know you, you know Helen, but do you identify the kind of writing you're doing in this book as as part of that, as, as nature writing, or how do, you, how do you characterize what this is? It's obviously a, a memoir, yeah. right, in the, a way? The truth is, when I was writing the book, I wasn't thinking about how anybody would categorize it, really, uh, and I didn't. I was more worried about whether I could write the, write the damn book. Um, uh, <laughs> and then when I'd read it, it was more a sense of, oh my god, I think I just wrote a book. Um, uh, so I, two years later, I'm starting to wonder about how it, how it fits in the scheme of things. Um, I think, the, I think the book I wrote has quite a lot in common with Helen's book in that Helen's pushing at the boundaries of that genre called nature writing and really is writing a book about her grief, sort of yeah. profound sense of grief about losing a father that she loved. And um, yeah, so I think there are some similarities between Helen and myself and I think uh, that, what am I trying to say? That I, I've always been suspicious of nature writing as a genre. Uh, it's, it's. It was probably part of what um, I wanted to get back against that in a way. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I frankly, painted the wrong portrait yeah, of your. Yeah, absolutely. World. So, uh, frankly, I've I've read all of the books by the the English nature writers and others around the world. They're incredibly talented writers. Many of them have become friends of mine in the last two years. So I have to be careful what I say. But it's it's. Uh, what but what I would say to their face, and I'll say to you, is I think a lot of it was written from a, a white middle class leisured perspective of somebody that goes out in their leisure time to see the beauty in nature. And of course, that reflects most people's, most urban people's experience of nature now. They go out periodically to see beautiful things and wild things. So it's no surprise that that's successful, that genre. Um, but I felt like, I still feel like there are blind spots in that. So there isn't very much about work in there. There isn't much, very much about the people that live in that landscape. And sometimes I think there's a risk with some of that nature writing that there's a sense of entitlement to landscapes where other people are already there. They're working, they're living, they possibly own the property rights to the thing you're looking at. Um, 
So I just wanted to try and level it up a little bit. Yeah. I wanted to put my dad and my grandfather back into the landscape, which is... Because where I live is the most written about piece of landscape on earth, the English Lake District. And yet, I could probably fill a truck full of books written about it in a romantic or picturesque way. And I could get all the books that mention the people that live and work in it on this table. So, right, right. so I think it's unbalanced. Yeah, you're, um, this is a, you know, the book is dedicated to your grandfather and with respect to your father, and they're very um, central characters here. So it's a, also a, a story of family um, and how, you, how your family, um, these shepherds, not just the shepherd, has survived. Uh, but your grandfather hated the tourists. And part of it was that he didn't, I mean, he probably didn't like them, period. But um, if I can, I can imagine what your grandfather is like based on your writing. But, um, you know, he also didn't like that sense of entitlement they had, that they had this sense of, which is a double-edged sword of owning this land. They yeah. felt like they owned it, you were saying. No, he, he did. He, he, I don't think he disliked it. I, I don't think he could comprehend it. I think his, his view of landscape was pre-romantic, pre, pre so pre-Wordsworth. It's pre that moment where you say it belongs to everybody because they care and they, they can see it's beautiful. So my grandfather's perspective was, not that that was wrong, just who the hell are you? You're clogging the roads up and you're, you're weird, you're from cities, you don't know what the hell's going on. Um, who are you crazy people? That, and by the way, how, how come you've got more money than we have? <laughs> uh, so that was my father's view. My, my, I think it's softened over three generations. So my father's view was more accommodating. He, my father would spend time talking to tourists and would explain to them. And I remember my dad being really surprised how little those people from cities in, in England knew about what we were doing. So, um, and him being slightly bewildered by that. He's like, wow, we're, and, and I always got the sense from, oh, wow, we're really vulnerable because those people vote for the politicians that make decisions about our lives. Those are the people that go shopping in supermarkets and buy the things we produce. If they don't know anything about what we do, if they don't care about it, then we're, we're in trouble. And, and then I'm probably the third part in that triptych and I, I think that I don't have the luxury of my grandfather. I can't ignore the general public. I can't ignore the tourists anymore. Um, the lambs I sell make a quarter of the price of the lambs that my grandfather sold in real terms. Yeah. And I'll tell you something really, this is how screwed up the modern food economy is. My lambs are a quarter of the real price that they were when I was born, uh, but they're considered expensive in supermarkets because Chicken, which can be industrialized better than lamb in huge sheds with antibiotics and all the rest of it, is something like 10 or 12 times cheaper than it was when I was born. So you end up in these weird traps where you're trying to race to the bottom, where my family have raced to the bottom with lamb to produce it for a quarter of the price, and it's still nowhere near cheap enough to compete with industrialized chicken. And I, th I saw a thing the other day, I think in the UK and America, the share of chicken in our meat diet it's something like tripled in the last 30 years. Oh. And I saw this great program on TV recently saying um, how great that was. That was because we love chicken. And I was screaming at the telly, no, it's nothing to do with how much we like chicken. It's because it's chicken is becoming cheap, 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 right. to the point where it looks like the only option when you're in a hurry in the supermarket and you're trying to feed your family and you're getting paid minimum wage and you're in a rush. Chicken looks like a no-brainer. But it's only a no-brainer if we're ignoring all of the consequences of that. You invoke, like, right, your hands are in, um, your life is in the hands of people who could make decisions have a profound impact on you. And a scene that hits hard um, and in the book, and I'd never read an account of this episode from the position of someone like you, which is when um, mad cow disease or whatever comes and you have to uh, foot, essentially... Foot and mouth disease, yeah. Foot and mouth yep. disease, yeah, yep. sorry. Um, and you have to... Um, essentially kill most of your animals. Not the, mm. the herdic sheep, but um, yeah. a lot of the others. Yeah. Um, I, I, the, the truth is, apologies if anyone doesn't like my politics, but uh, the, the truth is that that incident, which is one in a long series of food scares and food disasters in the countryside, has radicalized me. I didn't used to be at all radical about these things. And frankly, the banking crisis of 2006 7 has radicalized me as well, to the point where um, somebody who would once have described themselves as sort of conservative with a small c, I, I don't feel that way anymore. I think, I think we have to have different rules and different regulation and different systems uh, to bring about the things that we want to happen. I don't think we can leave everything 
uh, in the way that I once thought we could to just to the, the market and to market forces. And right. I don't think we can have governments that step aside. The government in the UK thinks that interfering in food or farming is none of its business. And there'll be people here maybe that agree with that, but I, I think it's wrong. And uh, I think at an, on a number of levels from the consumer right up to government, I think that we need to construct the, the landscape we want, construct the animal welfare we want. Um, and yeah, we, we can't just leave it to supermarkets. We know exactly where that leads. It leads to the death of rural areas. It leads to um, uh, everybody getting paid minimum wage, everybody then having to buy the cheapest possible food, and you end up in this sort of negative spiral that just goes down and down and down. Um, people aren't just consumers, are they? They're, they're, they're farmers and they're makers and they're employees and they work in factories. And they, uh, If we just look at the consumer part and we only care about the cheapness of things, we'll, we're going to be fundamentally wrong. Right, right. What is the true cost of the things that we consume? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I guess one of the kind of radical concepts in the book, and radical not because it's new, it's old, but the context that you put it in is the notion of the commoner and common land. You were talking about that earlier. And I really appreciated that because, you know, I mean, having grown up reading red tales of knights and kings and the commoners, you know, I had this very, like, you know, ridiculous idea of what a commoner is. And can you talk a little bit about that and how yeah. it's important to to you? And okay. Your so, so our landscape is one of the few places where a sort of medieval system still exists. Um, but it's a medieval system without the top layer, without the aristocrat, right. the feudal landlord at the top. So, Got rid of them. Uh, so the, the mountains where we live, this is fantastically English, this is so messy, forgive me. Um, <laughs> the mountains where we live often still belong to the descendants of the aristocrats, the feudal lords of the manor, okay? But uh, the deal was uh, they had no interest in these very poor mountains hundreds of years ago, so they struck a deal with the peasants, basically, my people. And the deal was, you can graze the mountains with a certain number of sheep each, but when we, when we need you to fight against the Scots, you have to turn up with a pitchfork or a sword or something <laughs> and fight against the Scots. And if, if any of you study the battles between the English and the Scots, you'll see that everybody was running away all of the time. <laughs> and I think it's because the terms of, the terms of um, signing up into that army were, were, were flaky. Nobody really wanted to get killed. Um, but about 250 years ago, there was a revolt in our area, and uh, basically my ancestors and hundreds of others turned up at the point where they were supposed to go off to fight the Scots and said, no, we're not fighting the Scots, um, and we'll hang you from a tree if you try and make us. Um, to which the aristocrats said, oh, it's, all, it's okay, you can all go back home, it's fine. Um, and we, here's the really funny bit, we kept the right to graze their mountains. And that, law, that right is enshrined in law, and the fact that we don't pay any dues on it for 250 years is enshrined in law. So I have more legal rights to use the mountain than the person that owns it, which is fantastic. Um, Sweet deal. Uh, and recently a mountain was sold in the Lake District, and it came out that the only thing that the owner was buying was the right to walk a herd of ducks up the village green. <laughs> yeah. So, so the, the, the truth is... Um, and I'm betraying my politics here, but the truth is, I think this is an amazing example of, of, of the little people, if you like, the nobodies, the peasants, uh, getting one up on, on the system, a sort of very European feudal system, effectively winning, earning their rights, their legal rights, and the rights are the rights of a commoner. Mm -hmm. So common, a, a common, a mountain of co an area of common land with us, has an owner, but the owner can be sort of fairly insignificant quite often. But more importantly, it has commoners, and they have this legal right to use it, to take its wealth from it. Um, and, and I'm one of those. I have a right to put, uh, on one of the fells where we go, to put 72 adult sheep, um, and, yeah, to be there in a certain time of year, to come off at a certain time. And we still have... Um, they used to have manorial courts that, that judged indiscretions, like putting too many sheep on or not pulling your weight in the gathering. Um, we now have a sort of slightly more democratic version of that where the shepherds gather together and th there's never any business to discuss because everyone's scrupul scrupulously honest. Um, so they sing sort of folk songs, basically, shepherding folk songs. <laughs> and get drunk. Sounds Getting drunk, really. <laughs> Very nice approach to politics. I mean, there is that long, there's a long history of kind of radical politics and um, land, relationships to the land. That, like, you know, if you work the land, then you have a... Yeah. an idea of it, and, and that really gave rise to a kind yeah. of a sense. And, and, of in, and in, I mean, my, one of my literary here, I have a couple. One of them, 
was Hemingway from here just because I love his writing, not because I think he was an admirable man. But, um, but another is John Clare. So in the 19th century, as most of Britain is enclosed and fenced and, and passed into private ownership, and most of the commoners lose or have their common rights bought, uh, there's this amazing man called John Clare in Northamptonshire who is a peasant, basically. And he writes these beautiful poems, poems about uh, his, his love for what was disappearing. And, yeah, I, yeah. Um, well, I wonder if your work at UNESCO, so you're trying to work with them on sustainable tourism and particularly thinking about people being tourists in places where people work, which is yep. probably everywhere in the world, right? Um, but um, if, if that is an effort to kind of reconcile those different notions of property that we were talking about earlier, the, the ones that we all have as tourists toward a beloved yep. landscape and then the ones that people have... Yep who work the land, who live there, who rely on it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and the, and the truth is, um, the me, the me, the 15 year old me that just didn't like tourists like my grandfather did, um, that person long since disappeared. I, I think the answer to many of the problems is, is, is a sort of twist of the tourism, basically. Uh, turning the tourism in the right direction. And uh, it's been a thrill, thrill for me in the last couple of years, partly because of my book, partly because that's the way that the wind was blowing anyway. Many of the hotels and tourism businesses in the late district where I live um, are now uh, telling the story of the landscape. They're telling the story of the farmed landscape. Mm -hmm. They're serving the food produced in that landscape. It's amazing that they ever weren't, but they weren't. Um, and, and they're training their staff so that they can explain what the visitor is looking at out of the windows of the beautiful hotel. Um, and I think in those kind of th changes... Is the, is the future, really. So the, the numbers where I live are amazing. So it's 800 square miles. There are two or 300 families farming it and sustaining it and keeping its landscape character. There are 43,000 people, non-farmers, non who live in the three towns in our national park. And there are 16 million people a year come and visit. Isn't that, isn't, isn't that amazing? Oh, wow. Um, and they spend 2.2 billion pounds a year. So you don't have to be a genius to see that if you want to keep the historic farming alive, you start talking to the tourism people and oh, yeah. Uh, yeah and you and you try and twist a little bit of that uh 2.2 billion pounds in the right direction but you're not you're not um talking about like you know working farm you're not bringing people up on the fells with you to help you gather your sheep yeah the... people people want to do that they want to people want you... to do that i have two shepherd friends who partly because of the things that have happened with my book and the conversations that have happened, but have realized that there's a demand now for people to go onto the fell and to gather the sheep. No, no visitor, not one of these 60 million people has ever done that, has ever gone to the mountains, fetched those flocks of sheep down and done it. And as one of my friends said to me the other day, he said, I'm not making any money from the sheep on the mountain, but I think I might be able to make some money from taking people up to fetch them <laughs> off the mountain with them. And, and that's not a new thing, is it? I have a friend who's a potter who who makes pots and used to sell the pots for like 15 or 20 pounds and now charges 60 to 80 pounds for the person to make their own pot. Which, so it's, yeah, it's a symptom of the world we live in. People actually do want to do these things. And This is the solution to the inexpensive lamb. If you get them raising and adopting the lamb, <laughs> then they'd be willing to pay more to yeah. eat it, perhaps. But, but, but the, the truth is you learn, don't you? Yeah. So, so my learning, if you like, for the last two or three years has been that I had, it, I had people wrong, actually. Yeah. So everywhere I go, I meet amazing people, who t people in cities, people from completely different backgrounds to me, who, who tell me how much they care. They care about the land, they care about animal welfare, they care about the soil, they care about the things that are happening in their name or because of how they shop. And they, do, and they want things to be better. They want things... And I didn't realize how many of those people there are, how many of you there were. And, and that... That gives you sort of power to your elbow. I feel like that gives power to my elbow. I think, okay, maybe I'm not so crazy. Maybe, maybe there's a lot of us that care about these things. Maybe we can make it different. And maybe I'm just under the spell of Wendell Burry, but I, I, <laughs> I, I just like the fact that... I, I love that about books. Maybe I'm idealistic, but as a writer, you dream that you write a book about the ideas that you care about and that somehow, in a tiny little way, somewhere, that might change the world or change the direction of something and... Time will tell whether I make any difference, but it's nice to try, isn't it? Right. Well, and um, was it... So let's talk about the other thing that's changed about you. Because So you... At the beginning of the book, if you haven't read it, is there's a great scene in um, James in his element at, reacting against school, which you obviously got over because then you went to Oxford and did very well there. But um, 
Um, you you started um, tweeting. You developed a Twitter okay. account and following. Were you doing? Did you do that because of the UNESCO stuff you were doing? Was that uh, what prompted it? No, um, I didn't want to do Twitter. I thought Twitter was a waste of time. Um, yeah. In fact, I thought Twitter was Kim Kardashian talking about her clothes and her bottom and God knows what else. And um, and I thought this and has it got is. yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of things. I thought this has got nothing to do with me. This yeah. is a celebrity head nonsense. Um, Oh, I think I just called Kim Kardashian in there. <laughs> um, I didn't mean that, Kim. Um, uh, but I had some friends who said, you know all that stuff you care about? Well, you should communicate with, you know, you should tell, show people what you do on Twitter. So um, I started putting pictures on of, of just the work we do. So I put pictures on of the sheepdogs, the, the sheep, the things that are happening on the farm. And oh, almost immediately, I was amazed. The, the response was incredible. So. Uh, even from right from the start, there were dozens of people all around the world saying, what are you doing and why are you doing it? And is that right? And how do I buy the stuff that you produce and not the horrible stuff in the supermarket? And you quickly realize, wow, there's this, everybody's a little bit worried about what's happening with their food and what's yeah. happening. And everybody wants to do something about it, but they don't really know how. And um, so I, the truth is, I, I enjoy it. I enjoy having a conversation with 85,000 people. And not all at once, it's a little bit difficult, but um, I enjoy trying to share what I know and, and in turn being changed by it. So I, I learn loads from those people. Um, and I think it's really interesting to know what people are thinking. And, and, and I find it very, very regrettable how disconnected people are from their food. And I, and I think we have to find bridges so that we know what each other's doing. I, I want to know why you're shopping in a certain way and why you're worried about animal welfare. And... I want you to know what I'm trying to do. So I'm trying to do the right thing, but it costs more money. So you have to find my thing in the shop and you have to try and buy it. If we don't have that conversation, we're, we're in really big trouble. But that's another way you've come very full circle, right? Wanting to communicate um, and talk to the outside world because when we meet you at the beginning of the book, as I was saying, you're, you're in school and you don't want to be there and you know the only thing you ever want to do, which is probably the way you still feel, is to be on your farm raising sheep um, living the life that your parents have lived before you. Um, how did you, how did you move away from that? Was it going to school, going to Oxford? I mean, what? Uh, no, go, the truth is, going to school, school when I was a kid convinced me that the rest of the world was bonkers, and I wanted nothing to do with right, it. Right, right. Um, uh, what persuaded me to go back was cynicism, actually. Um, in that, when I got into my early twenties, my family were going slowly broke on the farm, and. Uh, although I'd observed my father and grandfather, and I wrote about this in the book, fighting and spoiling each other's lives in some ways, as fathers and sons can, I realized I'd stepped into the same thing with my dad. So I, uh, I, I love my dad to bits. We lost him 18 months ago. But when, we, when I was 20, we were just butting heads. It was a classic sort of father and son thing on a farm where we're in a family business where there isn't enough room for two chiefs. And um, uh, yeah, just I had terrible fights with my dad, basically. And um, uh, and realized that it doesn't matter how much I want to do this thing, it's actually his thing. I'm, I'm 20 years away from having any control over this. And it looks it's your like Prince Charles moment. <laughs> <laughs> 20 years? Um, I think, uh, oh, God, I've insulted the royal family now. Um, the, uh, yeah, yeah so, so I was butting heads with my dad and... Uh, and it wasn't me doing me any good. I think there comes a point where you think, hang on, I'm not becoming a nice person. This is making me a bit bitter and twisted and surly. Yeah. Um, curmudgeonly, I think somebody called me earlier on today. <laughs> uh, so um, I, I basically fell out with my dad, and my two sisters were, really, turned, they were younger than me and turned out to be really like, book smart and school smart. And I used to, the truth is what happened is my sister used to get me to do her homework when she had like a date with a boyfriend, and like a hist history A-level homework. And... Uh, one night I did her history homework and she was like the smartest kid in the school at history and um, she, she came back from school absolutely steaming mad the next day because the, on, her, on her history homework that I'd done for her, it said your usual standard's really good but this is excellent. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, the, uh, and for me that was like a big thing because I'd flunked out of school, nobody had ever told me for like five, six years that I was smart or anything, I've uh, I didn't have a lot of self-esteem about it, probably. Um, I've gone a bit Oprah now, haven't I? And, but the truth is, I just kind of went, oh, I get it. And so the cynical thought I had was, 
if my dad won't roll over and let me be the boss of the farm, uh, maybe I do what the other people in this village, this community do, which is I need to go to university, I need to get a white collar job. I, I, this is how cynical it was. I, I knew I would hate the university, I knew I would hate the job, but it didn't matter. I thought if I do that for like 15 or 20 years, I'll be like those people. I'll have enough money to stay in my own community and, to, and, I'll, and I'll be around when the crunch point comes. Yeah. So I actually did about 15 years of weird jobs that I didn't want to do, but, um, but then it came good. Um, and I'm back on the farm, and the fact I wrote the book and that some of you wrote it means that I've just finished building a farmhouse on the farm that was my grandfather's, and um, yeah, it's all worked out okay. Well, I want to give other people the opportunity to talk to you and ask you questions. Um, can you read, just give them a little uh, taste of your wonderful writing before we open up the mics? So just before I read this, I should just tell you something really, which is when I set off to write the book, I thought it was going to be a sort of farming version of the old man in the sea. I was, I saw, yeah. <laughs> so, so like a sheep instead of a marlin. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it was going to be about my grandfather and me. So this book's been in my head for like 20 years, and when it set off, it was about an old man and a boy, and my, grandf and my dad didn't figure in it much. The truth is, because when I was 20, I didn't realize how cool my dad was. I, I thought my dad was a loser, because he couldn't make our farm pay and all the rest of it, which is horrible. Sorry, Dad. Um, but the truth is, when I was writing this book, my father got cancer and was going to die, and I knew that. And um, the book sort of in the writing, maybe... It's, I it gave the book some of its better qualities. The book became a letter to my dad, so I thought, my dad's gonna get to read this if I hurry up, hurry up with it. And I wanna tell my dad why I respect him and why I love him, and why I was wrong 20 years ago. And uh, yeah, I wanted to, to put all that as well as I could into words. And it must, have rubbed, it must have rubbed off because I was saying to Alison before we came out today, I've had four, five, maybe six letters from people who have read this passage to either at the funeral of somebody that they loved, often somebody that worked on a farm or worked on the land, or um, I had a couple of letters from husbands and wives saying that they read this passage to, uh, as, the, as the last thing they did with somebody that they loved that was dying. So you don't expect any of that to happen, but uh, maybe you'll see why, because I, I think it's about what our lives are about. There's no beginning and there is no end. The sun rises and falls each day and the seasons come and go. The days, months, and years alternate through sunshine, rain, hail, wind, snow, and frost. The leaves fall each autumn and burst forth again each spring. The earth spins through the vastness of space. The grass comes and goes with the warmth of the sun. The farms and the flocks endure, bigger than the life of a single person. We're born, live our working lives, and die, passing like the oak leaves that blow across our land in the winter. We are each tiny parts of something enduring, something that feels solid, real, and true. A farming way of life has roots deeper than 5,000 years into the soil of this landscape. So, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, James. So we're going to bring the so, lights up. Um, can I, t can I yes. tell you one slightly silly thing? Sorry, I was trying to go into questions. Um, I should have told you what my dad thought about the book. Yeah? Um, so... What did my dad say to me? Well, he, my, my dad's like sort of typical Mr. Working Class Dad. So uh, I said, have you read it? And he said, yeah, what took you so long? <laughs> uh, you should have written this 15, 20 years ago. I knew you could do it. I was like, okay, well, that's nice. And, um, and then I went into the kitchen to see my mom and I said, how did it go? And she said, he's just cried the whole time that he read it. Um, sorry, I'm going to cry now. And my sister, who um, could talk about things with my dad better than I could, um, Colored him a couple of days later, and she said, what do you think of James's book, Dad? And he said, I'm really surprised that I come out of it as a fucking legend. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so my message to all of you is, even if you don't write books, um, if there's somebody that you love, make sure that you tell them. Tell them how much you love them and, and why you love them and why you respect them, because the moment will go, and I'm, I'm lucky the moment didn't go on me. I got the chance to do that. I'm crying, but it's all okay. <laughs> Well, um, no tears, just questions. Um, we'll bring the mics around. Please wait for the microphone to come to you. I see a hand way up there. Hi. Because um, we are recording this for posterity, so we can watch you cry no, again I'm and crying. again. <laughs> uh, the English have almost learned how to show their emotions. <laughs> we admire you. <laughs> Hello, I have a quick question. 
Um, I myself don't know much about sheep or their temperament or the animal themselves. So I was thinking, could you explain what it is, you know, how they behave? Are they social? Do they mimic things that you've seen in human behavior okay. or vice versa? Okay, I'm going to just say this. Uh, I'll probably get into trouble with some of you, but um, uh, people on Twitter keep saying, um, using my pictures and saying, look, it's Trump supporters going to the polls. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and I ignored it a couple of times, and I'm like, no, 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 no. Um, sh sheep, um, the sheep that we have, uh, called primitive sheep, as in uh, many of the modern breeds of sheep have been in, uh, what farmers would call improved, which is you selectively breed them to have more meat, to grow quicker, to do the other things that you would uh, want them to do. And the slightly sad thing about that is that they lose many of their natural instincts and their Street, street smart, if you like. Um, but the primitive sheep, uh, with the older genetics in them, uh, still behave like the older sheep did in the, in the past, but sort of more natural. So uh, the sheep that we have go to the mountains. They spread out across the mountains to their own place. They're hefted, is the word that we use, which means that they go back to their same place in the mountain that their mother taught them to go to. Um, and that, the most amazing thing about what I do is that that chain of mother sheep teaching daughter sheep where to live on the mountain is absolutely unbroken, at least for a thousand years and possibly for 5,000 years on the mountain where we farm. And I don't, there's not many places in the world where that's true, where that still exists. Um, but if they, uh, but when the sheep are scared, they flock together. And the truth is the shepherds use uh, that instinct to be able to manage them. So. When I'm not on the mountain, they spread out and they do their natural behavior. When I need to bring them down from the mountain, I take my sheep dogs and we put them around the sheep. And when they see the dogs or they see the shepherds, they flock into like a large flock, like you might have seen on the photograph. And we're able to fetch them down to the lowland. Um, but one of the best things about uh, our sheep and the primitive genes in them is that they, uh, they behave like wild animals. They're really smart, basically. Um, so if there's really bad weather coming, sometimes before the weather forecast tells us there's really bad weather, my sheep will have come down from the mountain to the, to the edges of the mountainous land, the fell land. Um, and somewhere in their heads, they've worked it out for themselves that uh, the bad weather's going to come. Uh, they're able to survive if they do get buried in the snow. I give the example about the modern sheep dying in the snow. The reason that the heritage sheep didn't die in the snow is that they, uh, somewhere deep in their evolution, they've been through that before. And they, they ate their own wool, and they ate the roots of trees, and they ate the grass, and then the, the roots of the grass, and they did whatever it took to survive. And um, so, yeah, I don't know whether I've answered all of the question, but uh, our, our relationship with them is basically trying to look after these sheep as, with as little stress as we possibly can, trying to let them be as natural as they possibly can. And the one time of year where I have to intervene a little bit more is at lambing time in the spring. So if something's going wrong, I don't just stand back and let, let the lamb die, for example. I would have to catch the sheep and we would um, uh, get the lamb out and hopefully look after the mother and the lamb. But what's really nice is they've, if you did it, they would, the sheep would be terrified of you. But because the sheep's grown up with me looking after it whenever I need to and feeding it in winter with hay, um, my daughter laughs at this. But like some of the sheep, when you pull the lamb out and you're trying to make sure it's breathing, the sheep will be licking like your hand. It, it's not, I'm not anthropomorphizing that, it's not saying thank you, but it's, it's, it's licking the goo off you, basically, but it's, but it's so comfortable with the shepherd and trust the shepherd and trust that what's happening is safe, that, you know, there's a, there's a sort of bond of some kind there between the animals. I hope that answers your question. I could talk a lot more about that. Thank you. I have a question about the fences on your farm. Okay. Were those gathered from rocks that were laying around the land and built? How old are they, and do they separate your property from the other? Okay, okay. Other um, so this is a question about what I think you call fences, we call walls, oh. the stone walls. Um, um, so how, how old are they? And um, the, some of them are, uh, one of my friends in the valley where I spoke about the snow coming for 16 weeks, he still has the original walls from when that was a Viking settlement a thousand years ago. So, uh, and they're very clearly still there, and he very clearly repairs them and puts the stones back on the wall tops periodically and looks after it. Um, some of them are even older, as I understand it. There were people there for thousands of years before that. 
And, uh, but some of them are newer. Some of them are newer than you might expect. So in some, some parts of the late district where I live, uh, they were built in the 19th century. There was some enclosure in s certain places. And they were, I'm told, not built by the natives at all, but they were built by Irish navvies, I Irish working gangs. Uh, as for where the stone came from, it nearly all came from local qu quarries. Uh, some of it was picked up from the land, some of it's taken from the riverbeds where all the stones are in the bottom. Uh, but a lot of it was taken from local quarries. And I wish I'd brought some pictures actually, because uh, the, there there's a valley called Wasdale, or Wasdale as we would call it. And if you see the stone walls in the bottom of there, it's absolutely stunning. It's like, it's like looking at Machu Picchu or something. It's, it's incredible. You have to follow him on Twitter or Instagram. I have a question about your dogs. Okay. Um, you have a British actor that play, played on Doc Martin, and yeah. he did a documentary on canines. Yep. And part of the documentary was on herding dogs. I understand that there are different kinds of herding dogs. Yep. But in the documentary, they showed the breed that you have, and they pointed out that they are natural killers of sheep and that it's only the commands of the shepherd that keeps them in check. Is that true? It's 90% it's true. It's 90% true. I, it, it's all true except for the fact that they would be killing them except for the commands. It's not quite as extreme as that. So what's uh, probably explained best by taking it back to a puppy. So we, uh, if we haven't bred the puppy ourselves, we would get the puppy when it was eight weeks old, when it's old enough to come off its mother's milk. It would come to the farm. Um, it, it doesn't want to kill the sheep, but it, it has like a wolf's instinct in that it wants to, as soon as it sees the sheep, it clocks its eye, its eye on the sheep and it wants to control the sheep and it wants to intimidate it. And something in its head tells it it wants to run round sheep. And um, in a way that other breeds of dog don't. You, you have the same puppy in another breed, no interest. Like a spaniel wants, a spaniel wants to fetch you a ball back, a collie just looks at the ball. You know, it's... Um, uh, but if a sheep runs past, the collie ignores it and the spaniel wants to go. So it's, this is all sort of selective breeding over 5,000 odd years. Um, so the puppy, the puppy left to its own devices as a wild animal eventually would learn that you run the sheep down and you kill it. Um, trained by the shepherd, it never ever thinks about killing the sheep. It thinks its job is to round the sheep up and do what the shepherd tells it. So I don't actually know of any examples ever of a, of a like a border collie, working border collie in our area killing a sheep um, because they would be trained. It doesn't even occur to them. So my dogs, uh, I, I was going to say my dogs think, and then I thought, how do I know what my dogs think? But uh, I think what my dogs think they're doing is that they're part of my pack. I'm the pack leader. And that our, uh, I'll make sure that they're fed with biscuits every night if they just do the thing we do where we're rounding up sheep every day. And that, and that satisfies their intense need to go around things and to gather them up. And that's, it's not a million miles away from wolf behavior. You know, you do what the top wolf says, uh, we'll all get fed, and at some point he'll throw me a bone and we'll survive and move on. So it's, it's, it's based on that sort of quite brutal thing. But it's, um, yeah, the, 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 I mean, my dogs, you'd never see them be rough, really. It's quite rare that you'd even see them like nipper sheep because that's, I tra train them not to do that. Um, but when you see the young dogs that are only half trained, it's amazing how much instinct they have in them. I have a little dog at the moment that's a year and a half old called Meg. And she's the daughter of my two other dogs, Tan and Floss. And they're both good. And um, yeah, she's like a robot. So if I fetched her here now, she'd be bored out of her brains. But if you put some sheep at the back of the thing and I said away, she would just be on it immediately. So uh, yeah, they have incredible focus. And it's amazing how much of that is just in the brain waiting to go. You mentioned uh, how curious people are about your way of life, and I want to thank you uh, for the generosity with which you meet that curiosity on social media and ask this question. For people who, for groups of people, uh, groups of cultures that are vulnerable in any place in the world, I wonder if part of the lesson of your experience over the last few years is that every vulnerable people must learn some of these communication and social media and political skills that you have been practicing. Um, th thank you. That sounds like a lo lovely compliment. Um, I'm always wary of telling anybody else what to do, but I think probably, you're bro broadly speaking, you're probably right. Um, I saw an amazing thing. I was about five years ago. I had to go to a conference in Edinburgh as relating to my UNESCO work, and I saw this amazing thing. They um, 
Did you used to call Uluru in Australia, the big red rock, did you used to call it Ayers Rock? Yeah, so, so do we. We now know that that's culturally insensitive and it's actually called Uluru Katajuta, I think. Um, but there's been a real effort in many of the Australian national parks to, to listen for the first time ever properly to the people, that, the first people, the people, the sort of Aboriginal people. And at this conference I was part of, they live streamed a conversation between the women of the Aboriginal community and one of the park managers. And none of the Abri they told us at the start, none of the Aboriginal women will talk directly to you as strangers, and none of them will talk to the camera directly, because that's not what they do in their culture. Um, but they will talk to the park lady, who spent the last 20 years earning their trust and learning how to speak with them. Uh, and she'll be a sort of intermediary. And it was absolutely amazing to see this woman, the skill that she had to, get, to persuade these women to talk. And they all started chatting away, just like people anywhere would. Um, and it was lovely to hear their voices about what that rock meant to them spiritually and what, how offensive they'd found some of the behavior of us in the past. Um, so I'm not sure those women will ever want to do Twitter, but I, I think your, sort of general, your general sentiment's absolutely right, isn't it? If, if you can have a voice and you can shape your own story and you can control your own story and the media through which it comes, that's got to be a good thing, hasn't it? I, I've always felt that. I think maybe where the book, my book came from was growing up thinking, we don't really control the story, our own story. And that makes you really vulnerable in the modern world, doesn't it? If you're not controlling your own story, somebody else is. Somebody else will tell your story and put you in a certain light. So, um, yeah. And, I, and, and my love of, my late found love of social media is, bec is the directness of it. Um, so I get lots of journalists asking me if they could interview me and then put my words onto the page. And I'm like, no, give me the page. I'll write my own. Um, <laughs> You're stronger if you can write your own story, aren't you? You can tell your own story through social media or journalism or whatever else. Sorry, journalists, but I, um, I think it's good. Um, thank you all for all your questions. Um, before you go, I'm going to make you um, do one more thing that you don't like to do, tell people what to do. Just give us some advice. So if we're going to the Lake District, if we're going to Matterdale, where you are, how should, how should we be good tourists? How should we approach that? Um, I think you should... To a very large extent, do whatever makes you happy. But uh, around that being happy, I think you should really think about not just how you see the landscape. I think it's often a very good discipline for all of us, me included, when I go to other places, to think about how the people in it see that landscape and their place in it. And, uh, and that there's inevitably an, an economic side to this. I think please, please think carefully about when you go to places about where you're staying and where your money's going to end up. And is there another way to do it that means the money goes into the pockets of local people? Um, and there are some, uh, I, with my work with UNESCO, I, I did about three years ago, I did my last, my, some of my last work with UNESCO, and it was in African communities. And uh, one of the things I did was really, really simple. We sat down with many of the local people in the community, and I just said, okay, what pisses you off about white people? Yeah, and it was like, what, what, is the, what are the things that white people are doing when they come here from America, from the UK, that you find culturally inappropriate um, and ugly? And it was things like taking your top off. So many of the young Europeans and Americans were getting sunburned in Africa with their tops off. And when you spoke to the, uh, the people from the local African community, that's deeply, deeply offensive to them. It's ugly and nasty and, and offensive. Um, so as, as a visitor, try and think about the things that you might do that are gonna really hurt or offend other people. And, uh, and some of the work I've done in that context was with the hotels. You know, simple lists of, please don't do this. Yeah, because the average, when you spoke to the kid with his shirt off, he was horrified to discover that he was doing something that upset the people in the community he had visited. He just didn't know. This hour has gone by far too fast. It was wonderful talking with you. Thank you so much for coming to the festival. To Chicago, his first trip to the United States. He came here. Thank you. Thank you all.